All righty. Well, once again, good morning. I'm so glad that you're all here with us this morning as we continue and conclude this series that we have been working on. Uh, this series, we, we started it a couple weeks ago, four weeks ago to be exact, and it's called From Chaos to Community. And we've been taking this, this journey of the Christian year. And so the Christian year goes in this kind of natural flow. We start in December when Christ is born, right? And we, we celebrate Christmas, we celebrate the birth of Christ, and we go through the first half of our year learning about the ministry of Christ shared with us in the Gospels. And then we reach this, this time that we all know at the end of the Gospels, which is Easter, which is where Christ is crucified and then resurrected. And then after the resurrection, Christ ascends to heaven. And then after Christ ascends, we have the book of Acts, which we know as the Acts of the Apostles. And this includes all of the different disciples, including Paul. Paul joins the ranks of the disciples at this time as well. And we hear about the Acts of the Disciples. One in particular, we celebrate on a special Sunday known as Pentecost which is where the Holy Spirit came down upon the disciples, upon the apostles in Acts. And that's kind of when we, when we transition from being just a Christian to all of a sudden being a disciple. And so we've been studying how does that take place? We go from birth as Christ was born, then we're baptized, then we're Christians, and then we're disciples. How does this transition take place? And we learn that transitions, more often than not, are messy. Transitions are a little bit messy. And so over the past four weeks, we've been looking at the life of Father Abraham. We've been looking at his uh, uh, a time in Genesis, looking at his life and his genealogy that came after him and seeing what they had to say. And so the first week we learned that the first step of the journey took place in remembering that we are not alone. First and foremost, we had to remember that we are not alone in this. The first reminder of being a disciple of being someone called to spread the ministry of Christ is that we're not doing it on our own. None of us are a lone wolf. We all have our brothers and sisters around us who are helping us share this message. We're not alone. And in the second step of the journey, we looked at Sarah and her actions against Hagar and Ishmael, and they seemed pretty harsh. And we wondered, what in the world can this message mean for us? And we realized that the second step is to acknowledge that we are not perfect. As disciples, we are not perfect. Sometimes the world can set us up to the standard of thinking that we have to be flawless human beings. But I have a feeling if I said, if you're flawless, raise your hand, none of our hands would go up. Because we know we're not flawless. We're not perfect. In the same way, Sarah is not perfect. Uh, but we're really genuinely trying that's what sets us apart is that we are trying and as disciples we acknowledge our imperfection we acknowledge that that's not us we're not perfect but we're trying our best we're working towards it and remembering that god is with us in every step and then last week we looked at isaac and abraham and their shocking story that really always seems to appall us and be pretty uh, striking. Maybe sometimes we take the side of Abraham, but in reality, Abraham almost killed his son. That seems pretty intense. And so we remember through this story that God will give us all that we need. Ultimately, God will give us all that we need as disciples. We have the tools that we need. We are not found lacking. Our cup runneth over even though we may mess up sometimes, even though we may be confused or others may hurt us, we know that we have all that we need. And so that's where we pick up this week. Well, I remember I told you last week that Isaac got the heck out of Dodge immediately following this story whenever Abraham nearly killed him. Isaac left. He was gone. And so that's where we're picking up in this next story. Isaac is now a grown man in his 30s. 
And it's time for him to continue on his legacy, to continue on his generation. And so this one's really going to jump around a lot. You're welcome to follow along in your Bibles if you'd like to, but I might recommend either following along in your bulletins on the left-hand side or following along up on the screen. We're reading from Genesis chapter 24, but we're jumping around quite a bit. And we're reading the NRSV, so however you'd like to follow along, uh, I invite you to do that and hear these words of the author of Genesis. We start out with a man who works for Abraham, one of Abraham's servants. Hear now these words. And so he said, I am Abraham's servant. The Lord has greatly blessed my master, and he has become wealthy. He has given him, him being Isaac, flocks and herds, silver and gold, male and female slaves, camels and donkeys. And Sarah, my master's wife, bore a son to my master when she was old, and he has given him all that he has. My master made me swear, saying, You shall not take a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites, in whose land I live. But you shall go to my father's house, to my kindred, and get a wife for my son." I came today to the spring, and he said, O Lord, the God of my master Abraham, if now you will only make successful the way I am going. I'm standing here by the spring of water. Let the young woman who comes out to draw, to whom I shall say, Please give me a little water from your jar to drink, and who will say to me, Drink, and I will draw for your camels also. Let her be the woman whom the Lord has appointed to my master's son. Before I had finished speaking in my heart, there was Rebecca, coming out with her water jar on her shoulder, and she went down to the spring and drew. I said to her, Please, let me drink. She quickly let down her jar from her shoulder and said, Drink, and I also will water your camels. And so I drank, and she also watered the camels. Then I asked her, Whose daughter are you? And she said, The daughter of Bethuel, Nahor's son, whom Milcah bore to him. So I put the ring on her nose and the bracelets on her arms. And they called Rebekah and said to her, Will you go with this man? And she said, I will. Then Rebekah and her maids rose up, mounted the camels, and followed the man. And thus the servant took Rebekah and went his way. Now Isaac had come from Beer the High Roy and was settled in the Negev. Isaac went out in the evening to walk in the field, and looking up, he saw camels coming. And Rebekah looked up, and when she saw Isaac, she slipped quickly from the camel and said to the servant, Who is the man over there waiting in the field to meet us? The servant said, It is my master. And so she took her veil and covered herself. And the servant told Isaac all the things that he had done. Then Isaac brought her into his mother Sarah's tent. He took Rebekah, she became his wife, and he loved her. Will you pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, I ask that the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts together be acceptable in your sight, O God. For you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Now I want to start out this story by kind of giving a little bit of a breakdown and maybe, just maybe, uh, breaking down the view you might have of this wonderful story. Because on the outside looking in, whenever you're just reading it on paper and not seeing it happen in real life, it seems very normal. It almost seems kind of romantic. It kind of feels like they should have some kind of blurry edges on the film screen and the sunset is coming up over the hills as Rebecca, with her hair flowing as she sits sideways on the camel, you know, is looking down to Isaac, her man, who just has rippling abs, you know. That's what you imagine, and this scene is just so breathtaking and beautiful. But in reality, it's a little weird. It's a little uncomfortable when you realize that Isaac is 35, 36 years old, and Rebecca has just hit puberty. She's about 12 or 13, and she is going to marry Isaac. 
It's a little weird, right? It's a little uncomfortable now. You wanted to think of, a, you know, a grown Jennifer Connelly or someone, but instead she is a child. She's very young. And so it's hard to wrap our minds around this, but the reality is that it may sound strange, but it's not as weird as it may sound, even though it should be frowned upon during these days. Uh, but, but during this time, it was very common to take a child bride. It was very common to have this kind of relationship. But it's very weird, right? It doesn't seem like something that would ever happen today, right? Tell me it doesn't happen today, right? It still does. It still happens. It's still very common, unfortunately, frighteningly, hauntingly. This is still something that can be a little weird, that can be a little tense and a little bit uncomfortable. And the reality of this situation is that this is another reminder, another of those reminders that we have to realize that we are human. We have to remember that we are human. This cycle of oppression and abuse would likely continue. We see it in Abraham. We know that Abraham had multiple wives. We know that he had slaves. We know that he had people that he oppressed. We see that Sarah cruelly and harshly reprimanded Hagar. We see her wanting to kill her and put her out into the desert. We see Abraham nearly killing, nearly slicing the throat of his son, Isaac. And now it's time for a new generation. And the first thing that Isaac does as a young man is take a bride much, much younger. The cycle continues. The cycle will continue. And so... I'm going to kind of take this to a positive spin before we kind of have the hard truth coming down on us. And I want to show you this picture because there's something powerful about generations and the way that they all kind of look similar. I almost put a picture up of Logan and her family. Logan's very fortunate in the sense that he, she has all of her grandparents and even some great grandparents. And she has this picture of her mother's side, her maternal side going all the way up for her to her great grandmother and they are just like stamps of one another they are all almost identical their genes are so strong that i know some of you have seen lisa which is my mother-in-law and i know you've seen lisa she's come before and sometimes you have to take a double take because they look so similar and it's the same way with her grandmother and her great grandmother they're all just striking resemblances and so i wanted to show you this picture because i didn't want to embarrass her i instead wanted to embarrass my family and so I want to show you this picture of my dad whenever he was around my age with my sister laying on his chest. I don't know how well you can see it. It's, it's, kind, of, it's kind of dark. But if you can imagine, you can kind of see this is his head right here. And he's got the beard and he's got, he's got kind of Beatles hair. So if my hair was a little bit more like Paul McCartney... Uh, in the 60s, maybe, but he, he has the Beatles hair and he has the thick eyebrows. And really, I'll, I'll try, maybe I'll post this picture online later so you can really get the full grasp of it. But we really take after one another. I look very much like him. If I were to recreate this picture uh, and have, you know, maybe whenever I, one day down the road, long down the road, have a child. Uh, I can have the child lay on my chest and lay down just like my dad here, and it might not it might not even be able to tell the difference, really. We look so strikingly similar. And what I want to get through this picture is to show you that we inherit things from our family. Now, some of them are very clear. Some of them are like Logan's family. Some of them are like my family, where maybe someone has told you before, you know, you look just like your mom. Or you look just like your dad. Sometimes we do things that make us look just like them. Maybe we have things that we say. And then there are other things that we inherit. Some other things that we can inherit, both good and bad. Things that are good and bad. For instance, from my dad, I inherited uh, his, his, he has a very good sense of like just being comforting. He's very patient. 
And so I think I inherited that from him. I got his listening ability, but I also got his workaholic nature. There was a couple weeks ago where I had a meeting scheduled for every single night. And like this week, where I have meetings scheduled so often and I nearly kill myself, you know, just busy, busy, busy. And Logan is like, calm down. You need to slow down. You need to break things up. But I have my dad's workaholic nature in that way where we, we want to go and go and go. And similar to my mom, I, this one's kind of a double-edged sword, but I got my mom's sarcasm. And so on one hand, I'm very, very witty. I have the ability to qu- have quick comebacks. But on the other hand, I say things I shouldn't say, right? We have those kind of quick things about us. So we inherit our parents' bad habits sometimes, right? We inherit things that are not so good about us. And so in the same way Isaac inherits things from Abraham, he inherits the good faith, a good faith in God, a good relationship with God, but he also inherits Abraham's tradition of oppression, his tradition of hurtfulness, maybe some of Sarah's bitterness and anger. And so the hard truth here, the thing that I want to kind of us to see from this story, the hard truth is that we're still human. We still have this human nature. We're still broken from generation to generation to generation. We are constantly pursuing perfection, but we're still human. And so the hard truth that I want to kind of give you, go ahead and get it out of the way. If you're not out the doors after you hear that, good, we'll move on from there. But the hard truth is that God does not spare us from our humanity. God does not spare us from our humanity. I don't know why. I can't tell you why we have to be human. I can't tell you why we have to have free will. I can't tell you why I could choose right now to knock over the candle and burn down this church. I can't tell you why I have that ability. I can't tell you why we are. I can just tell you that God doesn't. And when you look out there, you see the brokenness of man. When you look from generation to generation, you see the brokenness of man. You can see it very young. My little nephew, Zeke, my brother's always been very rough and tumble. My brother, you know, he's the one that had the boxing bag in his room and he'd punch it all the time and he had holes in his walls whenever he went through his angsty teenage years, right? And, and we're seeing it already in Zeke. Zeke's got that aggression. He's cute as can be. He's adorable. But at the same time, he's got a little bit of that tiny aggression starting in him already. We inherit humanity. We inherit humanity from our family. That's the unfortunate hard truth of this reality. We are not perfect, as we talked about a couple weeks ago. We're not perfect, and we are human. That's the hard truth. It seems like that shouldn't be a hard thing. We should be excited. We're human. Wouldn't you rather be a human than a duck or something, right? Like, it's great to be human. Who doesn't love that? But at the same time, we are human, and that can be a bit of a bummer. That can be a hard thing to live with because as humans, we can really, really mess up. We can make some bad errors. But you stuck with me, and so you get the good news as well. You get the next step. Yes, the hard truth, we are human. God doesn't spare us from that reality. But the good news is that since Christ... A transition of love has been taking place. Since Christ, we're becoming equal. We're becoming raised up. We're becoming loved. Male and female, free and slave, no matter who we are, we are becoming equal in Christ with the grace of Christ. And so the good news here is that no matter what, Even though God doesn't spare us from being us, God never 
abandons us. He never abandons us. Regardless of how bad we may screw up, regardless of our humanity or how far we may push God away, God never abandons us. He was always with Abraham. He was always with Isaac. He was always with Christ. And he will always be with us. And so we can tie all these together. If we take a journey back over the past four weeks, we've seen Abraham who is starting this generation, who is, who is you know, trying to have a child to continue this generation and grows old. And God is where? He's with them. And then later we see Sarah being cruel to Hagar, forcing her out into the desert. They're both alone, angry, and bitter. And where is God? God's with them. And then last week we take a look at Abraham and Isaac as Abraham takes his son up on the top of the mountain and prepares to slice his throat, to murder his only son. And what happens? Where is God? God is with them. And so this week we see Isaac, we see Rebecca, we see their lives. We know they're going to have trials. We know they're human. But where is God? God is with them. God is the constant in these stories. Whenever I say in our prayers and praises, whenever I say that in our time, I say, God, we thank you for being with us in the good and the bad. I mean that. I'm genuinely saying I appreciate that God, even though he may not spare us from the evil of humanity, from the evil of world and sin, he does still remain right there with us. He stays right by our, by our side. And so, for our final step of the journey of being a disciple, we acknowledge the first step, we're not alone. We have each other. The second step, we're not perfect, but we're sure trying. The third step, we have all that we need. And then the final and most important step is that we have not been, we will not be abandoned. God is with us. Emmanuel. He is our refuge and our strength. The most important factor of being a disciple is this fact. Remember that God is, he has been, and he will be with us. Will you pray with me? Dearly Father, I thank you so much for this time that we got to join together and learn what it means to be a disciple of your ministry, a disciple of your grace. God, help us to share this message. Help us to share this life. Remind us that we are not alone, that we are not perfect, that we have all that we need, and that we have not been, nor will we ever be abandoned by you, God. Thank you for being with us. It's in your wonderful name that we pray. Amen. Amen.